Hi everyone, I'm Clark with CK Med, and this episode is powered by Med School Tutors, your resource for one-on-one -on -one online tutoring for the USMLEs, shelf exam, and even the residency application process. Our tutoring incorporates custom study schedules, content mastery, and even test-taking strategies that you're not really gonna get anywhere else. And I know this because I used to be a student with MST before I even tutored here. For a free phone consult, use the link in the description below, Mention that you heard about MST from CK Med on YouTube and use this discount code CKMedPlus for your special pricing. I hope you enjoy the video. Hello and welcome to CK Med. My name is Clark and I'm going to be taking you through respiratory infections. I want to make a shout out to Nikki Shaw for creating the backbone of this PowerPoint as I've added in and adapted details from your lectures to make sure you get all the important information to approach diagnosis from respiratory infections. So before we kind of dive into um, all our different infections, it's important to know what are the risk factors for respiratory infections. So things such as smoking, we know that directly damages your ciliary epithelium, uh, allowing us not to be able to expel anything from our lower respiratory tract, and that can lead to an increase in infections. Things like intubation, this is just taking a tube straight into the airway um, that could directly introduce things such as Klebsiella and Pseudomonas, and we know that we're giving you into we're in, intubating you in the hospital, so this is a nosocomial infection. Other things such as suppression of cough reflex, so things like taking codeine, um, which is found in cough syrup. Uh, this can suppress our cough reflex, and so if we swallow anything or breathe in anything. Um, that could introduce bacteria to our low, lower respiratory tract that increases the risk of respiratory infections. Other things are immunosuppression, uh, makes sense. Um, chemo patients or patients with recent transplants, um, HIV patients and corticosteroid treatment patients, um, this all increases or decreases immunity, which increases risk of infection. And obviously sick contacts and poor hygiene, uh, poor hygiene, that's gonna uh, increase our risk of infections as well. So let's talk about kind of a little bit about this anatomy and how this works uh, as far as how our respiratory system functions to clean, uh, keep us from being infected. So we know we have our upper airways, uh, our nose and our mouth, and we swallow things down. And we have our epiglottis here, which is a, a, a site of one of our infections we're going to be talking about. We can swallow things down our esophagus, which we're not talking about today, but also breathe it into our trachea. And down our trachea and our bronchus and bronchioles, down to our alveoli, we have different epithelium. Some of these, starting in our bronchus, going down to our bronchioles, and even up in our trachea, they're going to have our cilia. And the importance of our cilia is to move in one direction, bringing our mucus and our bacteria and our little particles that we breathe in each uh, every breath to get trapped. We need to bring it up until we can get it into either our airways where our macrophages can eat it or all the way up out so we can cough it out. Uh, and so we cough it and spit it out onto the person sitting next to us or the back of someone if we're sitting behind someone in class, or we simply just cough it so we can swallow it down our GI tract and uh, the acid in our stomach likes to get rid of lots of bacteria. Um, so those are the ways that this kind of works. So defense mechanisms within this airway, we talked about that cough reflex. Um, this is st stimulated by our vagal, uh, our vagus nerve, because that has sensation in our respiratory tract. Other things such as IgA, so this is uh, an immunoglobulin, which is secreted in our, um, our mucosal surfaces, uh, such as our respiratory tract. And so this is something that's not specific um, to any of our organisms that we're being infected with. And uh, so the, a patient can get the same organism or same infection over and over and over. Um, and um, this is because our IgA is not specific. We're not going to have a, an increased defense against anything in our respiratory tract. However, recovery as far as systemic symptoms and stuff like that, that's where it comes down to our IgG uh, found in our body. And since we have uh, kind of those little proteins off the bacteria or whatever brought in and presented to our T helper cells, um, that's going to increase immunity as far as in our serum. So um, if a patient or mother and father bring in their child and they say, hey, our child has been having uh, recurrent infections and it seems like it's the same thing and you look at his chart he's had it two or three times and you're thinking, oh, maybe respiratory syncytial virus. Take that as an example. And they might ask you, why is there some uh, immunology problem? Do they have some uh, immunodeficiency? No, it's just simply that 
because this is respiratory infection, it's involving your respiratory epithelium, and you're uh, on the surfaces, you just have IgA, and that's not specific, and we never make it specific, and so they're still prone to those infections over and over. Other things such as lactoferrin, so this is a protein we secrete on our mucosal surfaces. Um, we also have transferrin in our blood and stuff like this, but lactoferrin is something we secrete out, and this grabs iron to keep it away from bacteria so that they don't grow or have access to grow from it. Other things such as our mucus, we talked about this, but remember this associates itself with cystic fibrosis. So cystic fibrosis is your CFTR gene mutation, and so it's that F508 mutation, and so this is a problem where we can't uh, pretty much uh, have any power washing or power salt water washing of our airways. Uh, that's pretty much what it does. It secretes chloride, sodium follows it, and water follows it, and so we're not power washing our airways. And so our mucus that's in there gets kind of dry and sticky and gross, and that's cystic fibrosis. And this problem is we can't get this out, and therefore our, our ciliary function is uh, deficient. And at that point, we have uh, increased risk of infections, and that's why they have that. Uh, other problem is straight up uh, first order ciliary mechanism problems. So that's your dining arms, most likely associated with cartilage owners. But remember, smoking can do this as well, can paralyze that cilia. Uh, other defenses we have are alveolar macrophages and neutrophils. Um, they help clear up in our infections because they're phagocytic cells. So let's talk about these upper respiratory tract infections. Um, so first we're going to be talking about our common colds. We'll go into um, some of our sinusitis and otitis medias, our pharyngitis, and then influenzas. Um, so let's go ahead and talk about that. So the common cold, uh, rhinitis, nasopharyngitis, or rhinopharyngitis, um, this is something uh, that's uh, very common. We get this all the time, especially when we're trying to study for exams. Uh, this can come up for this. Uh, but it's simply what, what you want to do is be able to recognize in a stem, is this a common cold or is it upper respiratory or is it a lower respiratory? So things you're going to find are nasal congestion, running nose, a sneezing is super high yield to know that that's going to be uh, your upper respiratory tract infection, um, unless they have allergies, obviously, but uh, they wouldn't be asking that in microbiology. So um, as far as micro goes, sneezing is upper respiratory tract infection. And then you want to look for a normal respiratory rate. That means we're pretty much only in upper respiratory. If you see uh, a sneezing, uh, nasal discharge, and then increased respiratory rate, we know that we're talking with an infection that is upper and lower. Lower is specific more of not runny nose, maybe fever, uh, or definitely a fever, in addition to cough and sputum maybe. Uh, and then things like an increased respiratory rate. So definitely look for those guys. So the most common cause of uh, respiratory tract inf um, infections, upper respiratory tract infections of the common cold is your rhinovirus. So this is a costahedral naked, it's positive single strength RNA, so group four. Uh, this is one of your picornaviruses. This is the only acid labile one, however, of your picornaviruses, um, and thus the only upper respiratory tract um, is, is its target. So if it goes into the stomach, it gets broken up from the acid. And so it likes cold temperatures, 35 degrees or so, and so that's going to be your nasopharynx, and that's why you get it there. Um, so contrary to uh, popular belief, we seem to think that our rhinovirus, since it's the most common, is that cold that we get in the winter. However, this guy is actually in summer to uh, late fall, so summer to late fall. So definitely uh, know that that is where this guy uh, is in prevalence, and that's something they'll use in a stem, okay? Uh, pathogenesis, so uh, it's high yield to know that they use ICAM receptors. They bind to ICAM receptors in order to enter the cells. They also can use LDL receptors, that's lower yield. Um, but we can use, uh, the, this virus induces the production of growth factors, VEGF and EGF. Uh, and this can remodel our airway and cause like vasospat or uh, um, uh, not vasospasm. What I'm talking about, bronchospasm. And so, if this gets uh, incorporated into lowered respiratory tract, uh, such as in patients with COPD and asthma, we know that airway remodeling is bad, and we don't want that. So definitely avoid those in those patients. Um, uh, as, as far as most uh, bacteria or viral infections, it increases the risk of secondary bacterial infections, and most commonly is going to be your strep pneumo. Uh, so you can see otitis media and sinusitis following this. Uh, most, uh, a, a very high yield point, um, so 
is uh, what this guy can do. Uh, and this is one of the major things. The survival time and self-limiting, yeah, okay, that's not that important. But um, performing antigenic drift is very important. Like uh, this is something that influenza virus can do, and this is something that rhinovirus can do. So antigenic drift is just small mutations in the amino acids or the antigens you're presenting out on your surface. And this uh, kind of is an evasion tactic that they have um, from our immune system. And so our immune system has to keep creating different uh, antibodies as far as our serum goes, IgG, right? Uh, in order to uh, have any sort of immunity to these guys. And so if someone asks you, why don't you make vaccines to the common cold? And your simple thing is, well, there's so many serotypes due to antigenic drift that we wouldn't be able to get a vaccine to cover all of them. And that's why. Uh, your second most common cause is your coronavirus. This is a helical. And remember, our helical viruses are in unlimited size. They just keep growing and growing and growing. It is enveloped. Do you know why? Because you cover up when you're at the beach drinking your coronas. Um, and so it's going to be an enveloped. Um, right? It, I mean, yeah, you can think of a nude beach, but this is not a nude beach. This is an enveloped beach. How about that? Uh, and this is a positive single strength RNA. Um, uh, this is something and the most common cause for winter uh, common cold. So if they specifically say it's uh, you know December or January and they have a common cold, be thinking of coronavirus before rhinovirus. Um, so uh, how this guy works is pretty much it, it uh, enters the, the cells by binding to um, the, the epitopes on our host uh, on the host cells. It uses its spike proteins and hemagglutinin to do that, to bind and, and enter. Um, and then once it enters, it replicates, and then it uses the envelope from the endoplasmic reticulum. I don't know why this is important, but the microbiology department thinks it is. So uh, definitely know that this is one aberrant thing for coronaviruses, is that it uses the ER for its production. Um, diseases that it causes be beyond common cold is going to be your severe acute respiratory syndrome, or SARS. Uh, we had a, an outbreak in 2009 in Hong Kong, um, and the uh, symptoms of this are headache, high fever, body aches, cough, dyspnea, respiratory failure. And that's a problem because a, uh, a few people have died because of this respiratory failure. Um, where we get it from is we eat civet cats. Um, well, I don't eat civet cats, but apparently in Asia they do eat civet cats, which are little weasel cat things. Uh, they're actually kind of cute. Um, but then the civet cats maybe get it from bats, and so that's our reservoirs, our bats or civet cats. A diagnosis, as most uh, viral things, is we use ELISA and PCR. Middle Eastern Respiratory uh, Syndrome, MERS, uh, you have to be looking out for camels and the Arabian Peninsula or someone who had recently traveled or had ridden on camels in order to diagnose this guy. If you don't have that, then you can't diagnose this. Problem with this is very high mortality rate, 30 to 40% mortality rate. Um, so definitely know that guy as well. Adenovirus uh, is the third most common cause of common cold. And uh, it's icosahedral, it's naked, double-stranded DNA, so it's a group one virus. Um, and it, it, uh, for some reason, they like to know that, or have you know that infectious dose is five virions and that it carries its own DNA polymerase. Now, this is actually kind of important. Um, as uh, we are going to be physicians, we're also hooked up with some of our researchers and some of our treatment options that we have for uh, different diseases and stuff like that incorporate gene therapy. And so why not use a virus as a vector to transmit genes into our genome um, or into our, our host cells so that it can produce proteins that we want or something like that uh, when it already has and creates its DNA polymerase. And so that's why we like to use adenovirus for gene therapies because it carries its own DNA polymerase. Um, and so that's how you can kind of remember that guy. Uh, this guy is year-round, and so since it's year-round and we can get it confused with rhinovirus in summer and coronavirus in winter, they want to give you a couple other things. So um, this guy doesn't just cause runny nose, but it causes like pink eye, which is keratoconjunctivitis. It causes GI symptoms, so look for that, vomiting and illness, uh, nausea, maybe some diarrhea. Uh, and then other things in severe cases are hemorrhagic cystitis, which is like bleeding or bloody urine. Um, and this is usually associated with swimming pools plus peeing blood. That's probably going to be your adenovirus. Um, also, your conjunctivitis, you can kind of spread it on towels. So maybe, you know, a couple kids within a family have pink eye. Uh, just think it's adenovirus. 
virulence factors. So um, a couple of them are your fiber protein that allows for um, binding, and that's that long sticky thing in this little glass model in this picture. Um, other things are your penton base, uh, and this inhibits your mRNA synthesis once it gets into the cell. Uh, it breaks open, the penton base goes and finds um, our mRNA for our host M, uh, genome, or uh, host mRNA from protein synthesis, um, and it blocks that from, from happening, uh, or mRNA synthesis. The other virulence factors you can read, um, probably low yield on, on as far as testing. Um, remember that we give a live attenuated, this is one of our very few live attenuated vaccines for uh, military personnel only. So enterovirus is another guy of common cold, uh, but it's more associated with uh, respiratory illness, uh, even lower respiratory. And then you got to be looking out for that acute flaccid paralysis. That's a key buzzword for this. You usually get it with children swimming. So this is another thing, swimming, but swimming plus paralysis versus swimming plus conjunctivitis or uh, cystitis, so blood in, blood in your urine. So that's something you want to look for in these guys. Uh, it's naked, positive, single strands, RNA, non-polio, pregornavirus. So now onto your pharyngitis. <clears throat> so there's a lot of things that can cause uh, infections of your pharynx, uh, and that's pretty much thinking of sore throat. Uh, so to differentiate uh, the guys is pretty much uh, a lot of your viral ones lead to kind of white uh, tonsillar exudates, not all pus and stuff, just white tonsillar exudates, um, swollen um, tonsils and stuff like that, where you can have swollen tons uh, tonsils with big gooped tonsillar exudates. That's a lot of pus, and that's where you're going to be thinking of your group A strep or Streptococcus pyogenes. Um, other things is a pseudomembrane with Cornobacterium diphtheria, and I'll be showing you that, uh, those guys. Um, so diagnosis for uh, group A strep kind of comes down to a few things. This is known as your Centaur score. So you kind of count up points, the things you're looking for, are absence of cough, swollen and tender anterior cervical nodes, a temperature over 100.4, uh, which is 38 degrees C, which is pretty much saying, do they have a fever? <laughs> So absence of cough, swollen, tender, anterior cervical nodes, so swollen nodes in your neck, uh, fever, and exudates um, or swelling of your tonsils. So those will give you a total of four points, a point per each of those. Um, and once you have those four, you can do one of the modifiers. So this is the modified Centaur score, and you add in the age. Three to 14 years, you give a point. 15 to 44, you give zero points. And 45 and above, you give negative one point. So you take off from the initial ones you counted. Once you have these points, uh, this kind of uh, allows you to do your diagnosis for uh, score zero. There's no further testing, no antibiotics. They don't have group A strep. Uh, score one. Uh, you can have optional testing and optional antibiotics, but if you score a 2 to 3, 2 to 3, and this is the one they really love testing, 2 to 3, not 4, not 1, but 2 to 3, um, you need to perform a throat culture and rapid antigen test. So rapid antigen test for 2 to 3. Uh, following that, if it's 4 or more, uh, highest possible is 5 because you have 4 from the symptoms, and the fifth one from your modified is the age. Um, and so if you have four or more, then it's group A strep pretty much, give them antibiotics, there's no need for further testing or, or confirmation. Just give them antibiotics, have a nice day. Okay, so definitely know those guys, the two to three for rapid antigen tests and throat culture, and four and above for uh, group A strep, just give them antibiotics. Uh, that's an important thing for Centaur score. So let's talk about the strep pyogenes. It's beta hemolytic, it's sensitive to bacitracin, um, that's a, one of our differentiating features between our, um, uh, this is group A strep from group B strep, which is our uh, strep A galactiae, because that is the one that is resistant to bacitracin. <clears throat> it is catalase negative, um, as we know all our streps are. It's gram positive cocci, organized in long chains, and this is another thing that also differentiates us from group B strep or strep A galactiae. Um, virulence factor, so this is leukocytin. Um, so this is something you got to look out for. There's a few organisms that have leukocytin, and this is one of them. And we have to differentiate it from Panton valentine uh, leukocytin. Panton valentine leukocytin is specific, specific, specific. 
specific to Staph aureus MRSA. This is community acquired MRSA has the Panton Valentine leukocytin. This guy just has basic old, boring old leukocytin. Uh, so what leukocytin does is it says, hey, what white blood cells come and get me? And then it kills them once it gets there. And that forms the pus, and that's why we call it pusogenes or pyogenes. Um, it also avoids phagocytosis through multiple things. So um, it has a capsule, it has a C5A peptidase, it has M proteins, which mimics R cells. And so we go, oh, it looks like R cells are floating around in here, but it's actually a bacteria. Um, and that's why we have hypersensitivity reactions. And we'll talk about those in just a second. Other things, lipotechoic acid, that's gram positive bacteria have those, and then F protein. Toxins, so streptolysin S and O. Um, we use our O uh, because we can find anti-streptolysin O antibodies, and that's used for diagnosis. Uh, it also has streptokinase, which we use for treating of someone that has stroke, a recent stroke, or MI. We can throw in um, this guy, and it, it's going to lyse those clots. Uh, DNA is another thing as well. Um, so this can cause a multiple disease, pharyngitis, which is our strep strep throat. I'm sure you've had that before. If not, then uh, hopefully you don't get it because it's not that enjoyable. Uh, other things are scarlet fever. Um, so this is pharyngitis and you have a sandpaper scarlatiniform rash. Uh, remember that a couple other things could cause scarlatiniform such as toxic so shock syndrome toxin one, which is secreted from staph aureus. So look for like tampons or nasal packings when someone has a bloody nose or something like that. Um, that's going to be your staff that can secrete that toxin. But you'll have this scarlatiniform rash that spares the face. The rash is all over the body. You can feel it. It's like sandpaper, um, except it's not on the face. Uh, on the tongue, however, will be red, and it has those little pock marks. It literally looks like a strawberry. If you've never seen it, Google it. It's really kind of cool. Um, uh, other things, pyoderma, erysipelas, you'll get to in skin. Necrotizing fascia, you'll get to in skin. Um, and strep toxic shock syndrome. Um, that's uh, very rare. So our non-superative ones are going to be your hypersensitivities. You'll never hear the end of this guy. So rheumatic fever uh, is a type 2 hypersensitivity, and it has to follow pharyngitis always. Always pharyngitis. Pharyngitis isn't there. You can't have rheumatic fever. It has to have pharyngitis. Acute glomerulonephritis, which is a type 3 hypersensitivity, is following pharyngitis or skin infection in petigo. That's your honey crusted um, skin infection. Uh, it's kind of gross uh, in children. It's super infectious, but that can lead to your type three hypersensitivity, acute glomerulonephritis. So here we have Cornibacterium diphtheria. Uh, this is an organism we need to be vaccinating our children for in the DTaP uh, vaccination. Um, and this guy is uh, problematic um, because it causes severe pharyngitis and actually can cause death in uh, some patients and children especially. So the way I remember a little bit about this guy um, is I'm sure uh, during uh, your behavioral sciences you met Dr. Pettis. He taught you some of the classical conditioning um, and your operant conditioning stuff. Uh, he's a little older guy. He's always talking about this example of this stupid pigeon and it's in this cage and they're doing an experiment to see if the pigeon would pick at this little lever and then the corn would fall down and so he'd peck and corn and peck and corn and peck peck corn. All right, so the way I remember this is this peck peck positive cornea bacterium diphtheria. So this is your gram positive rods. Um, they form these Chinese letters or club shaped um, uh, organisms. Uh, so definitely look out for those descriptions for these guys. It causes pharyngitis, so uh, severe sore throat, fever, malaise. Uh, you're going to see that pseudomembrane. You can see up in the top right here, this is that pseudomembrane here, um, this gray silvery thing. And what forms this is uh, the bacteria kind of live and colonize the oropharynx. It does not go into the blood, so there's no sepsis with this guy. It needs oxygen. It's an aerobe. Um, so this guy secretes out an exotoxin, which it goes into our cells in our oropharynx and causes ADP ribosylation. Please repeat this a thousand times for path and micro to yourself. ADP ribosylation of elongation factor 2. This is insanely high yield. Anything for corneobacterium, they're probably going to just ask you this. 
Um, and what this does is remember elongation factor is important for forming that complex to hold everything together as far as making uh, and putting together our protein. So this stops protein synthesis. Um, and that is what our elongation factor two does. Uh, if we ribosylate it, stops it from working, so stopping protein synthesis. When our cells stop making proteins, they die and they slough off and then we bleed and we have fibrin formation and that is what's making up this pseudomembrane and that's why we see that. It all kind of hooks on to the back of this so when we try to scrape it, it's gonna bleed and the patient's gonna cry and yell at you. So don't try to scrape it when you see a pseudomembrane. Now, the other things you're gonna find with this is this bull's neck appearance, which you can see uh, this poor child right here. Um, and this is severe, severe uh, anterior uh, cervical lymph adenopathy. And that's known as the bull's neck appearance. Other things, this exotoxic can get, be absorbed in the blood, head to the heart and cause carditis, head to the nerves and cause spinal nerve paralysis. And if that makes its way down to your respiratory system, it can cause respiratory failure. And this is a common way that patients end up dying. Uh, in addition to if you have a pseudomembrane that causes obstruction of your airway, you're cutting off breathing, and that could be a problem as well. So diagnosis for this. Um, I'm, I'm assuming by this time you're going, why is there uh, an Ashley Tisdale uh, picture down to the uh, bottom right? And I have a way of remembering the diagnosis of auger for this guy, and this comes into handy. Um, so the way I remember this is Ashley Tisdale, <coughs> Tinsdale, Ashley Tinsdale, this, she's an actress that was in uh, one of the Disney Channel shows, uh, the, Secret, uh, the Sweet Life of Zack and Cody or something like that. And um, so Ashley Tinsdale, she heads into her doctor and she's got a sore throat and she tells her doctor, hey doctor, doctor, I think I have diphtheria. And so the doctor looks in the throat and he sees the pseudomembrane um, and he pretty much looks her in the face and says, hey, I can tell you're right. And so what you do is you grow this on Tinsdale auger because it's Ashley Tinsdale. And the doctor can tell that she was right. Um, and so tell you right auger. Um, and so uh, what this is is pretty much it's Tinsdale auger plus cysteine equals tell you right auger. And um, when you grow these organisms on there, they grow black colonies. And the virulent strains will create your cystinase, allowing you to cut cysteine within the auger. And you'll find a positive on that. Um, and then in order to confirm, you scrape off one of those colonies and you uh, scrape it across uh, the, another auger and then you put perpendicular and, and antitoxin, excuse me, an antitoxin. And what happens is since your organism is creating toxin and you have perpendicular to it, antitoxin, diagonally to these guys uh, at your 45 degree angle, you're going to see precipitate of your toxin and antitoxin complexes. And that's a confirmation test that's known as your ELEC test. So now onto sinusitis and acute otitis media. It's definitely important to understand and be able to diagnose these patients with this because these are severely painful and they can cause a lot of damage. So sinusitis, you're looking for progression after a viral infection. Uh, they have severe pressure and pain behind their eyes or between their eyes, severe headache, um, and their nose is going to be severely stuffed. Uh, acute otitis media, it's going to be inflammation and bulging of the tympanic membrane. Um, if it's a child that isn't talking, they might pull down on their ear, say, signifying that their ear hurts. Um, so let's talk about some of the organisms that cause uh, lower pharyn uh, pharyngitis uh, in addition to um, these sinusitis and infections. So Haemophilus influenza used to be one of the leading causes of meningitis. Uh, one of the leading causes of otitis media, and uh, epiglottitis. It actually is the only really main cause of epiglottitis uh, anymore, um, but it's pretty much it's decreasing in incidence because we have our HIV vaccine, um, and we'll be discussing that in a second. So Haemophilus influenza is a gram-negative cocobacillus. So definitely be looking out for that cocobacillus because only a few organisms have that shape. Um, it is catalase positive, coagulase negative, um, which is very similar to your staph like Epidermis or Saprophyticus, um, but however, this is gram negative, so it is not a staph, and it is cocobacillus. This is not a cocci. Uh, virulence factors, it has a P2 protein, which allows it for attachment in respiratory epithelium. Uh, it has LPS, well duh, it's gram negative, and that's why it caused meningitis and also sepsis too. 
um, because the A protein of your LPS can do that. It also has IgA protease uh, that allows for cleaving of your IgA and so it can help avoid the immune system uh, within your respiratory tract. And then most importantly, and it's most severe, most severe virulence factor is polyribose ribitol phosphate capsule. This is an antiphagocytic capsule and it is only, only, only found in your B strain. So your Haemophilus influenza B strain has your PRP capsule. All the other Haemophilus influenza strains do not have your PRP capsule. So definitely know that that is the difference between them. So if they were to ask you a question of, oh, someone has otitis media, they're not vaccinated, and we found this at coxobacillus ends up being something that has a capsule, right? And it's saying, well, what is the difference between this one and the non-virulent strains that cause otitis media of this same organism? You're saying PRP capsule, okay? Uh, that's definitely important. So as far as diseases that this causes, uh, usually it occurs in unvaccinated population like immigrants or anti-vaxxers. Uh, it is the most common cause, the B strain of epiglottitis, which is your cherry red epiglottis. Um, it shows up on thumb sign on x-ray, which you can see over there. It's just pretty much swollen epiglottis. Um, there's better pictures of the actual thumb and why we call it thumb sign on, on Google. I'm sure you can find it. It causes strider, so you're going to hear that sound, expiratory wheeze and inspiratory, uh, both expiratory and inspiratory. Patient is going to be drooling. Why? Because the epiglottis blocks off not only your esophagus, but also your respiratory um, uh, tracheal. Uh, tract. So you're going to have trouble breathing. In addition, you're going to be blocking off outflow through your throat um, because this thing is so swollen, you'll have drooling. So definitely be looking for that in stems. Other things are tightest media, as we know. Culture for this guy. So this one wants to grow on specific, specific culture. And uh, this is going to be your chocolate auger. Now, a few things grow on chocolate auger, but this one is very specific because it has to have two factors in order for it to grow. These two factors are factor 10, uh, also known as hematin, <laughs> hematin, but it's hemin. Uh, hematin or, and hemin are synonymous terms. And this is factor 10, so I just remember hematin. Uh, you also have factor 5, which is NAD, uh, nicotinamide. And guess what? How many cents is a nickel in the United States? It's 5. So nicotinamide is for factor 5. So you have to have hematin and nicotinamide uh, in order for it to grow on this chocolate auger. And that is specific for Haemophilus influenza. If you see that, if you see like someone has an infection that only grows on chocolate auger with 5 and 10, you have H influenza. You have nothing else. That's the only thing that requires that. All right, next is Moraxella cateralis. Um, so this is a gram-negative diplococci. You're going to come across multiple of these uh, gram-negative diplococci, and they're what is known as the Neisseria species. Morxella used to be Neisseria. We now call it just Morxella cateralis. Um, because of the shape, it was gram-negative diplococci. Um, but there's something differentiating this between your Neisseria gonorrhea uh, and Neisseria meningitis, and we'll talk about that in a second. So uh, this guy also is a common cause of otitis media in children following viral infections. However, S. pneumo is still more common, so don't let that trip you up. If they just said, oh, they had a viral infection and now they have a bacterial infection on this causing otitis media, and it just said that, that's it. Just period, question mark, what is it? It's strep pneumo. If it said, oh, on investigations, we looked gram stain and it's gram negative diplococci, gram negative diplococci, where strep pneumo is gram positive, diplococci, if it's gram-negative diplococci, you know you have Moraxella cateralis, okay? Um, and so uh, the virulence factors for this guy is beta-lactamase, um, so it's resistant to a lot of penicillins. Um, it makes biofilms, and this is something actually we can use to diagnose it. Uh, it forms a hockey puck sign on chocolate auger. So again, our uh, Neisseria species um, and associated Neisseria can grow on chocolate auger like H. influenza. Um, but this guy particular forms biofilms, and so we can actually slide the, the colony around on the auger, and this is known as hockey puck sign. And so how I remember this is there's a reason for that uh, guy uh, playing hockey down in the right corner. So and this guy going to make a large swing for that hockey puck. He's going to hit it all the way across the, the rink. So he's going to lift up 
his arm all the way up here. And guess what? He's going to show more of his axilla or more axilla cateralis does hockey puck sign. And so you just imagine a guy playing hockey and he's lifting up his arm showing more axilla. Then you have more axilla cateralis is the one that does hockey puck sign. So colonies, uh, these guys turn pink after 48 hours on this, uh, after we push it around for a couple hours uh, or a few hours um, on that auger. That's 48 hours later. Uh, that's a key feature they like putting up in stems. So how to differentiate this from other gram-negative diplococci, which is your other Neisserias, your gonorrhea uh, meningitis, is this guy reduces nitrates. All right, let's talk about some of our influenza. So influenza is a virus, we're gonna talk about in just a second, uh, it causes um, uh, respiratory infections, and we have to differentiate it as far as adults and children from your common colds. Adults, it's easy because common colds don't cause GI symptoms. If you have uh, common cold-like symptoms plus GI symptoms, you're mainly talking about um, your influenza. However, remember, our adenovirus also causes GI symptoms. So this is something you got to be careful of. So if you have um, <clears throat> symptoms of someone with common cold and GI symptoms and that's it, they aren't describing, and it's like a slow progression, you know, a couple days, slow onset, they feel eh, not too great. That's adenovirus. Now, if it says sudden malaise, headache, fever, chills, and muscle aches with occurring within a few hours, three to six hours, and you have, if you've had uh, influenza, you know what this is like. It just hits you like a train. Then you're thinking that this is influenza as opposed to adenovirus. Okay, GI symptoms, vomiting, abdominal pains come up with this as well in an adult, and that helps us diagnose influenza. Children, it's harder because GI symptoms are masked among your common colds and your influenza, so it's a little bit harder to diagnose. So what is influenza? Influenza is a helical, uh, enveloped, single-stranded RNA, negative sense, uh, eight-segmented virus. So this is one of your segmented viruses, and it comes into what we're going to be talking about in a second. So virulence factors with this guy. Um, on our virion, we have little... Uh, proton channels, and this is known as your M1 and M2, mainly your M2. Um, and this uh, is proton channels that once uh, this guy, and this is very particular of this, is the only RNA virus, other than retroviruses, only RNA viruses of your single or your double-stranded or uh, of your negative and positive sense that replicates in the nucleus. Okay, this is for one exception, one exception. So, um, in order for it to get into the nucleus and pop open, it gets into there, and protons within our nucleus go through these little M2 channels and changes a conformation within this virion, and it pops open and spits its eight segments into uh, our nuclear uh, space. And that allows us to then do, undergo its replication. We can block this little proton channel with amantadine and remantadine, which are drugs... Um, they're like antihistamine drugs, and we also can use it um, for patients with like Alzheimer's. Um, and so this is something we can use to block uh, um, uh, release of their genome into the nucleus. Uh, hemagglutinin is a surface molecule um, that allows for adherence and entry into the cell. Um, and neuraminidase is a protein that we have that allows for cleavage off of the cell uh, after we, we kind of form our little buds. And so when we're budding off our hemagglutinin, they're still stuck, and so we have to have an enzyme to cut them loose and so they can go and infect other cells. And that's your neuraminidase. Um, and so we can block that neuraminidase with oseltamivir, which is also known as Tamiflu. I'm sure you've heard of that. We have to give it within 70, 72 hours of onset of the illness in order for this to be effective at all. Um, so uh, a key feature of this guy, we talked about it as far as antigenic drift uh, for uh, rhinovirus, but this is another one that can do this. So antigenic drift is just gradual accumulation of point mutations. So point mutations. So you're just gradually drifting off uh, the road, okay, off of your train tracks, just dra gradually uh, drifting with small point mutations. Um, and so this is something that you can find in all A, B, and C influenza. Antigenic shift is specific for influenza A, and this is cause, the cause of pandemics. Um, 
uh, which are really bad. And this is a sudden rearrangement of the eight segments. Remember, we have eight segments in there. So if someone gets infected with one, say H1N1, and then someone that gets infected with H3N1, we can now have an H, uh, oh, actually, that's not a good, H3N5. Now we can have an H1N5, right? Because we just arranged the different uh, segments that produce different enzymes, and now we have an entirely new virus. So that's a rearrangement of those segments, and that's going to be antigenic shift. It's a rapid change rather than just little point mutations. Diagnosis, we got to look for four times rise in antibodies. That usually occurs in the convalescent phase, like two or three weeks after they're infected with this. Uh, it's just a confirmation test to say, hey, you were infected with influenza, and you're like, great, I'm already better. Um, but that's what we can do. So uh, complications, so uh, any viral uh, infections, we definitely don't want to give aspirin to children, even if they're going having a painful um, uh, symptoms. Uh, we can't give children any aspirin because it can cause uh, damage to the liver known as Ray's syndrome or Rye syndrome. Um, also, after influenza, this is one of our uh, viruses and infections that can lead to Guillain-Barre syndrome. This is high yield to know that influenza is one of the causes of Guillain-Barre. We have a few other ones, uh, especially in your GI tract you're going to get to when you do GI. Uh, but Guillain-Barre, as far as what you've covered so far, is one you should know. All right, so now on to lower respiratory tract infections. So things we're going to be covering here are your pneumonias, um, your specific infections such as whooping cough, um, your tuberculosis, your atypical pneumonias, um, and then some of your other additional infections. So there's a lot to go over, um, but uh, hopefully uh, I can make some of these a little bit entertaining uh, in order to get them put into your memory. Well, well, let's get some of the boring ones out of the way. So acute bronchitis and bronchiolitis just means that we have an infection of the upper bronchioles or we have one that progresses down into your bronchioles or your bronchiolitis, right? So your bronchi, sorry, um, or your bronchioles. Um, and so acute bronchitis is more commonly with your viral, and then bronchiolitis is something you're going to find with your virals in children, usually less than two years old. Most commonly is your RSV. And so how RSV kind of progresses, um, uh, we'll, we'll get to in just a few minutes. Other things such as your human uh, parainfluenza virus, influenza, adenocorona, and all those things can cause viral bronchitis and bronchiolitis. Uh, bacterial, your strep pneumonia, H. influenza, and chlamydophila pneumonia. So let's talk about one of these viruses. The first one we're going to get to is human parainfluenza virus, or HPIV. The most common strain is HPIV-1. Um, so risk factors for these are going to be malnutrition, overcrowding, your vitamin A deficiency, and lack um, of breastfeeding. Uh, this is because breast uh, milk uh, gives us some IgA. Why? Because we know as uh, students at SGU that we go to IgA to get our milk. And so therefore, that is the immunoglobulin that you find in breast milk, and that's IgA. So viruses, uh, this, uh, as far as what type of virus this is, and that should not have an E at the end, but that's fine. Uh, par uh, this is a paramyxovirus, um, which is a single-stranded RNA negative sense virus. Um, it's helical, and it has an envelope. Um, how it kind of works and its virulence factors. Um, so we only need a few or very small inoculating dose to cause the infection. Um, it has this hemagglutinin neuraminidase bound one fused protein. Um, and so we know that influenza has hemagglutinin and it has neuraminidase and they're separate, but this one has them fused. And this is one particular thing they really like asking about this guy um, is what is the virulence factor for entry for this virus causing this croup or steeple sign, um, then it's most likely they're going to be wanting and uh, getting at this HN1 fused protein. Um, we also have other proteins, our F and P protein, um, and this allows for inhibition of your interferon uh, like alpha and um, INF alpha and beta production um, and the signaling pathway within it, and pretty much this inhibits your immune response uh, that we have to this virus. Um, so it's kind of a way that it can avoid uh, our immune system. We also have our L protein, uh, which is uh, our RDRP, and so that's our RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, which we know uh, our negative sense RNA viruses must carry with them. Uh, the disease that it causes is known as croup, um, 
and uh, we can have a visual of this croup. So croup is like this seal barking cough. Um, and there's one video of this little girl laying down on YouTube. You might be able to hear her cough. I'm sure you know uh, what this uh, seal barking cough is. If you don't, then spend a little time on YouTube. Um, but as far as x-ray, we'll see this uh, constrictions in the airway, especially in children. Um, and that's what actually causes this constriction and croup cough. Um, and we call this steeple sign. You can see this kind of point right here in the trachea. So the trachea usually should go straight up and all the way up uh, and stay kind of straight and fat and patent. But we see that there's a constriction causing this point, which is your uh, steeple sign here. Okay. Um, uh, it also can cause, you know, bronchitis and bronchiolitis and bronchopneumonia, um, this particular virus. But uh, we're mainly going to be talking about this uh, kind of steeple sign appearance. Respiratory syncytial virus also can do your little steeple, and so therefore it's also going to lead to that barking cough and croup. It's known as croup or laryngotracheal bronchitis. Uh, that's another name you definitely should know. Uh, laryngotracheal bronchitis is another way of them calling that croup. Okay, uh, it's a seal barking cough. Steeple sign is on on that X-ray. Um, and uh, the thing with uh, respiratory syncytial virus is it's the most common. It's the most common cause of this, and um, uh, we find this usually in infants and children. I actually was just at the hospital a couple weeks ago uh, for class, and we had a patient with this, and I actually wrote up a report on this one. Um, and so it, it's usually how this progresses is patient has stuffy nose, a sneeze, and maybe a little sore throat, right? And then it progresses to where they start having shortness of breath, a cough, maybe like watery sputum, um, but nothing really that comes up. And that has shown me that it has progressed from upper respiratory to lower respiratory. And the most common thing that leads to this progression from upper to lower is a viral cause. And I'm thinking the most common that does that is your respiratory syncytial virus. So that's how you'll read that in stems is it goes from upper and then they say, oh, after a couple days, it goes to lower. And you start seeing a respiratory rate increase and stuff like that, and that's showing that it's a lower. Um, the season that this occurs, it's usually in winter. So similar to um, how our uh, coronaviruses, the second common cause of common cold uh, progress. So uh, just that initial um, presentation of common cold, you can't differentiate this from your coronavirus in winter time. Um, as far as specifically in Florida, and I don't know why, uh, but it also it travels from summer uh, through fall and winter. So it incorporates a lot of the seasons except for spring. Um, more in Florida. I don't know. Maybe it's just a lot of old people there or something. Um, so the variants for this has uh, hemagglutinin and neuraminidase are, they're, I'm sorry, it does not have this. It's absent, so it lacks this. It just has an F protein. And how this uses it is, and how it progresses, so it starts in the upper respiratory and it binds to your respiratory epithelium, your nasal pharyngeal epithelium. And it uses this F protein to take those cells and stick them together. And this is known as a syncytia. And then the virus passes from one cell to the next and then causes that to form a syncytia to the next cell. And then it tra pa uh, passes from that one to the next one. And it keeps doing this from the upper respiratory to the lower as to why you see the progression from upper to lower in respiratory syncytial virus. Um, and that's that F protein that's forming that syncytia. It's just a fusing of cells together. It also has a G glycoprotein um, that helps for entrance. Um, risk factors, so prematurity, um, remember that uh, prematurity increases risk of all sorts of infections, uh, but for this one specifically, uh, your bronchiolitis, especially your respiratory syncytial, look for prematurity as something in your patient. Um, however, this is only a risk factor for the first two years of life, so if they're three or four years old, then uh, a prematurity uh, is irrelevant to this person getting an infection. Child care or daycare, crowding, uh, low socioeconomic status, secondhand cigarette smoke. They like this guy. Um, if you have someone smoking at home, this also increases risk of respiratory syncytial virus. Down syndrome, this isn't necessarily a risk factor for getting the virus. It is uh, a risk factor for getting severe symptoms and problems and complications because of this. So Down syndrome patients have uh, low muscle tone. And uh, so when they have low muscle tone and they get respiratory syncytial virus, because it progresses to lower respiratory in children, it's going to have a lot worse um, as far as your pneumonia-like symptoms. 
Um, this patient uh, is going to have a hard time using your uh, accessory muscle use of your respiratory system, like your scalenes and uh, all those muscles in your upper, uh, your neck, uh, also your intercostals and stuff like this, because they have low muscle tone. So they're going to have trouble breathing, and that's why Down syndrome is written there. Um, uh, another thing that they like to talk about with respiratory and syncytial is the immunopathology. And so immunopathology um, came upon, upon when we finally said, hey, we've discovered a vaccine for this. And so we give them, gave them an inactivated uh, vaccine. And this inactivated vaccine stimulated your helper cells, your Th1. But on accident, it also stimulated your Th2 response. And so not only did we have a cellular in the Th1 response, in, as far as memory, we also had a humoral uh, response from your Th2. And so this was problematic because uh, these patients uh, not only just responded, hey, we have memory and they, we got in, infected with respiratory syncytial and let's go clear it up, but it's like, hey, let's use some nukes against um, this respiratory syncytial virus rather than just bullets and, and, and knives. Um, it used nukes instead. And so this actually, the immunopathology was severe enough that when these patients had this vaccine and then they got infected with it, that their immune system killed them. It was such a severe response. It was like a hyper uh, out, uh, allergic response, sort of. You could think of, uh, of it that way, um, but it was more of specifically your Th1 and Th2 response when someone had this vaccine. So do not give this vaccine to patients um, because you can kill them. All right, whooping cough. So this particular, this is uh, Bordetella pertussis. Uh, I'm sure you might have heard about this, and this was something that I talked about was in that vaccine, your DTaP or your Tdap booster. Um, and so your pertussis is a bacteria. It's an extracellular bacteria. Um, it has your lipooligosaccharide. It's gram negative. And uh, this guy is really weird because it's the only extracellular bacteria that increases lymphocytes to respond to it. So uh, as you know from immunology, uh, usually intracellular stuff like intracellular bacteria or viruses, we have our CD8 T cells responding to them. They look for MHC class 1 molecules, they go, there's something wrong inside, let's kill this cell. So that's what our uh, CD8 T cells do, right? And those are your uh, lymphocytes that respond to intracellular stuff. But if you had extracellular bacteria, we know our macrophages and neutrophils like to respond to that instead. So uh, you would think that with a bacterial infection, an extracellular bacterial infection, that you would have neutrophils and macrophages. However, this one actually draws lymphocytes. And so this is a commonality between your viruses, your intracellular bacteria, like uh, Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, your tuberculosis, and stuff like that. Um, and this is super high yield. Uh, I actually had a U-World question that asked, uh, what is similarities between five organisms? Uh, not all of them were intracellular. Uh, except, well, this was the only one that was extracellular, so I was like, oh, it couldn't be, wait. But then I remembered that this one increases a lymphocytic response, um, and so uh, that was able to help me answer that lymphocyte response was the answer to this question, hooking all those organisms together. So uh, risk factors for this, unvaccinated children, because uh, it's a general vaccine that we give to children. Um, so anti-vaxxers, unvaccinated children, immigrants, uh, you might be thinking of. Uh, this organism is carried by adults and given to children that are at risk. Um, this is known as the 100-day disease, um, a 100-day cough. Um, and so uh, this is uh, it's terrible. Uh, so transmission of this, you, we have adhesion. It uses fimbrae and pili. Um, and... Uh, it grows and produces toxins, right? We All those toxins we have over on the right here. So your FHA is your filamentous hemagglutinin. It agglutinates RBCs and it helps it bind to the, the epithelium. And then we also have our pertussis toxin, adenylate cyclase toxin, all these different toxins, right? Uh, adenylate cyclase toxin, you might remember from uh, actually biochemistry when we learned about our pertussis toxin and how it works and pretty much what it does is it stimulates uh, your GI subunit to be on constitutively. And that uh, pretty much says we're going to no longer allow for adenylate cyclase to work because we're stimulating your GI subunit. Um, and that's going to be continuously inhibiting adenylate cyclase. And that leads to uh, actually our whooping cough uh, symptoms that we have later. So then we also have uh, local systemic problems, which is some of the other toxins here. Um, 
So we have uh, uh, the, the stages, our catarrhal stage, which is just uh, when you're getting the disease and it's slowly developing, and then you have your paroxysmal stage. So this is where you have that whooping cough uh, symptom, the severe cough, you cough almost to where you vomit. You can actually watch this on YouTube as well. Um, you pretty much cough until the child vomits, and that's something that's a key feature of whooping cough. Um, and so they'll cough, 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 uh, trying to breathe, and that's what the, the whoop uh, sounds like. A diagnosis, so narrow, nasopharyngeal uh, swab and secretions, um, and we can check for that. And um, remember that we got to get this to the lab right away because it's susceptible to drying. Um, and this is something we cannot use any of our particular uh, swabs. We can't use cotton swabs to take this. We have to um, swab it with uh, some particular uh, organism or swab in order to get it. Uh, this grows on char uh, charcoal blood auger, so charcoal blood auger, also known as Bordet Gengo auger. Um, and so that's, uh, that's high yield to know that, that auger. So just practice saying that a couple times. I didn't have anything to to kind of remember uh, that for this. All right, so now on to our pneumonias. Um, so community-acquired pneumonia, and we're gonna start with our typicals. So the most common cause of community-acquired typical pneumonia is gonna be your streptococcus, pneumo streptococcus pneumonia. Uh, this is alpha hemolytic. Uh, it's resistant to bacitracin. So this is a weird test, and I have this in blue. Um, so usually what we do for uh, the alpha hemolytic streps is we test them through optogen. If it's sensitive, it's strep pneumonia. If it's resistant, um, then that's going to be your viridins group. And so um, how we separate um, these guys, I believe it's viridins. Yeah, it's viridins. And so... Uh, when we have this uh, alpha hemolytic, we usually are just using optogen, but you also have to look over bacitracin, and that's uh, an antibiotic we use to separate our beta hemolytics, so our group A and our group B strip. Um, strep. And so uh, it's kind of weird to think, why are we using, why are we talking about bacitracin for strep pneumo? That's not even on my chart in first aid. But the uh, rule of thumb is pretty much if it's sensitive to one, then it's resistant to the other one. Okay, so if you have an optogen sensitive, then it's going to be resistant to bacitracin. If it's optogen resistant, then it's going to be uh, bacitracin sensitive. Okay, so that's kind of a rule of thumb for these organisms found within um, uh, these al uh, alpha and beta hemolytic groups. Uh, this is a gram-positive lancet-shaped diplococci, and I put that picture down there to show you what lancet shape looks like. See how they're pointed like this? Um, I, I think that's one of the, the best pictures you can find showing what a lancet shape looks like. Um, and they like uh, referring to that. So this is uh, a, a common cause of recent viral pneumonia. This is uh, our bacterial pneumonia on top of viral pneumonia. So think influenza. Uh, sinusitis and otitis media. Uh, it also is occurring in splenectomy patients and sickle cell because you have autosplenectomy. So you lose your spleen in patients with sickle cell. And why is because this organism has a capsule and capsuled organisms get picked up by your spleen and so we can remove them if there's no spleen they're floating around in the blood and why is this important is because this organism likes to go to the blood a lot and this is why it's a common cause of uh, meningitis it goes in the blood and then it causes sepsis and it can go to um, the the CNS and your spinal fluid and cause meningitis uh, we also find this in HIV patients. Um, so um, virulence and pathogenesis. So it has that capsule I was talking about. It's a polysaccharide capsule. It has IgA protease. Uh, and again, this is another thing that has a lysin, but this one, because it's strep pneumo, is a pneumolysin. Um, and uh, this is uh, one particular for this. It inhibits the ciliary epithelium activity. So it stops it from moving, such as smoke. Uh, uh, smoking also does that and stuff. Uh, so definitely be uh, associating pneumolysin for that. It also is cytotoxic to the macrophages, endothelial cells, and um, your uh, neutrophils that try to respond, or your PMNs. And you also have autolysin and transformation, but uh, don't worry about those guys. Um, as far as disease, since it's a, the number one community acquired, let's describe what comes up when you spit it up. So it's going to have a, a reddish, that should have two Ds, brown, uh, rusty colored sputum. It may have small um, blood flakes or sputum, 
Um, but don't get confused with Klebsiella, which has like your whole sputum is just blood chunks and you'll have necrotic tissue within there. This is not necrotic tissue. This just has a little bit of blood. It's rust colored. It might be brown or reddish. Okay. Um, so definitely associate that with pneumonia. Um, also the risk factors for this, since it's community acquired, uh, you don't put people on ventilators like you do in, in giving someone Klebsiella. Uh, this is just someone that coughed on you and now you have pneumonia. Other things are Titus media and sinusitis. We discussed those. Uh, they've been becoming more resistant to penicillin, so that might be something that might show up on your step when you get there, um, but I I'm not sure. But prevention, pretty much we uh, create a vaccine against that polysaccharide capsule and uh, we can prevent this guy. And that's known as your pneumococcal vaccine. All right, next one is Klebsiella pneumoniae. Uh, so this is uh, something that causes bronchopneumonia. Uh, the uh, strep pneumo causes your lobar pneumonia. You, uh, microbiology likes to separate it based on your typical or atypicals. Um, and that's how they present. So you're going to have a high fever. You're going to have a rapid respiratory rate. Um, you're going to have kind of thick spit up sputum. That's going to be your typical pneumonia. Where your atypical is you're not really spitting up anything. Your fever's like okay. And you're walking around just fine. These guys feel ill in typical pneumonias. Klebsiella is a typical pneumonia, but it's one that causes inflammation and damage to your bronchioles rather than uh, just in having everything kind of pool into your alveolar sacs. So bronchopneumonia, um, this is a gram-negative bacillus. It's not motile, and you can see it up in the top right there. It's nice and little pink in this little picture. Um, risk factor is pretty much, uh, it's a nosocomial infection. You get it from ventilators or aspiration pneumonia from alcoholics spitting it up and then breathing it in. Um, pathogenesis, so um, like I was saying, the aspiration. And then virulence, uh, so this has uh, high affinity for iron because it has aerobactin and enterochelin. Uh, so it has siderophores to pick up that iron. Um, so that's great that we have um, that one virulence factor. So see if you can remember and think back to what that was uh, as far as what our defense mechanism against Klebsiella uh, for that particular aspect. It also has LPS because it's gram negative um, and that prevents phag phagocytosis. But remember the protein A portion can cause necrosis and damage to tissue because our immune system is responding going, what the heck is this? and they spit out all their enzymes and start degrading our lung and we'll have necrosis and that's what leads to the red currant jelly sputum. And you can see our Club Cielo's homemade red currant jelly down on the right and uh, that is actually a picture on the left one there of uh, some sputum uh, that somebody spit up into a little bowl. So that's actually what it looks like. So now you know what they mean by red currant sputum. So these guys are resistant to carbapenems. Uh, this is very high yield to know that if someone has aspiration pneumonia and they're spitting out a bunch of red stuff, we are it's contraindicated or we don't want to give a patient what antibiotic, that's going to be your carbapenems. Um, these guys uh, have, can form biofilms, so they're also difficult to treat. Um, and so this is something that comes into when you're putting a ventilator or uh, uh, endotracheal tube, ET tube, into someone so that you can uh, help them to breathe, say if they're unconscious or something. Uh, they use uh, type 3 fimbrae to make that uh, biofilm, and so they can hang on to that and cause an infection, you know, a few days after someone has entered into a hospital. Um, just remember that aerobactin and enterokillin. Uh, symptoms, so halitosis, I actually have no idea what that is, that was from Nikki's slide, but halitosis. Uh, and then that foul smelling sputum, red currant jelly, and necrotic tissue, lung tissue in the sputum. So when they say coughing up a lung, they literally mean it with club seal and pneumonia. Uh, diagnosis, uh, it is gram negative, so it grows on McConkie's. And then there's some lactose tests that you can do. You can find that in first aid chart of your gram negatives uh, in, in particular, but you don't need to know that really for respiratory right now. All right, pseudomonas. So this is another guy that comes in uh, as far as nosocomial in, in uh, the hospital, but you can also get it from environmental um, because this guy's found all over in the environment, especially water sources. It's a gram-negative motile rod. And you can see that in the top right. It's got lots of little flagella all over it, um, allowing for it to move. The disease it causes as far as respiratory is necrotizing bronchial pneumonia. So this is very similar to its presentation in Klebsiella. Um, however, the sputum that comes out is like yellow green and it stinks really bad. Um, this is uh, 
definitely something you're going to see with cystic fibrosis. So cystic fibrosis, lung infection, yellow stinky sputum, think pseudomonas, okay? That's your risk factor for this guy. Uh, also can be uh, causing uh, damage to your, your skin and all these necrotizing stuff in burn victims uh, and diabetics. So virulence, it has a polysaccharide capsule, it has a lastase and an exotoxin that it makes. Um, there's actually mnemonic and first aid that actually spells out pseudomonas um, and it has all these different disease things that spell out each of the letters of pseudomonas. Uh, so definitely check out that, that's pretty cool. Um, you don't really need to know that as far as right now. When you do multi-systems, you'll need to know that. Uh, but for right now, just know that it causes the necrotizing bronchial pneumonia. Um, so diagnosis is we're going to see a greenish uh, pyoveridin color on auger. And you can see it on the, the culture up on the uh, up in the top. So it's kind of shiny and green. And it's really beautiful, actually. And it smells like grapes. Uh, but remember that the sputum, smell, uh, the sputum smells really putrid. But the grapes uh, is what it smells like on, auger, on the auger. Uh, when I was in India, I uh, got to smell uh, this guy on auger. And it doesn't smell quite like grapes, but maybe a little bit. Uh, other diseases, swimmer's ear. So if someone has infection on the outside of their ear, their ear's all itchy and stuff like that, and then they have pneumonia, maybe you can put those two and two together. That could be pseudomonas. All right, so your atypicals. Let's go ahead and move on to these guys. So these are your community-acquired pneumonias, atypicals. Uh, these are your presenting, your low fevers with chills, scratchy throat, uh, maybe some pleuritic chest pain, loss of appetite, but they're feeling okay. They can walk around. This is uh, also another thing known as um, your walking pneumonias. So let's go ahead and dive into each of these. All right, so the first organism is, uh, I'm putting it first, actually, because it is the most common cause of walking atypical pneumonia. Uh, this is mycoplasma pneumoniae, and uh, this organism uh, is the smallest living organism that we know of. It's flash-shaped rod, and you can see that down the right, uh, and it does not have a cell wall. So because this organism does not have a cell wall, we can't use antibiotics that target the cell wall production, such as your beta-lactams, like penicillins and carbapenems and all those things. Um, they don't tar uh, they ca can't target this guy. And so look for a question that's saying someone has pneumonia, we give them antibiotics, and nothing happens. No change whatsoever. And they determine, uh, or pretty much you get to a diagnosis of mycoplasma, and they're like, why doesn't antibiotics work? Because it doesn't have a cell wall, okay? Um, so what these guys, they're these flash shaped, they have these little um, adhesion protein complex. Um, that's your P1 adhesin, and that pretty much sticks to the outer surface of the membrane. It's like a little outer ectoparasite, um, and uh, it secretes uh, hydrogen peroxide. That's one of its virulence factors, um, and it's cytotoxic, and it also damages not only the respiratory epithelium, but RBCs, um, and then this uh, can also inhibit the ciliar, ciliary movement, allowing for the pathogenesis of this disease. Um, you usually see it in people that are less than 40, really young, someone in close quarters, maybe college dorms or military recruits. That's what you're going to find this guy in. And they're just going to say, I don't feel well. I've been coughing and nothing really comes up. So you're going to have a dry cough. Uh, the sputum usually doesn't come up very much. Um, this guy can also secrete a community-acquired respiratory distress syndrome toxin, or CARD-ST. Um, I don't know exactly what that does, but some sort of toxin um, and uh, it never really came up other than that on the slide so I'm not sure how high yield that is um, so yeah you'll have that dry cough scratchy throat low-grade fever and the x-ray looks like the lungs are in for the worst they look terrible they look worse than just net, like uh, your typical pneumonias because your whole lungs are involved you're like what the heck is this um, it looks worse than they present. They come in, they're looking, they're fine. They're like, I just have a cough, what do I have? Um, but the x-ray looks terrible. And that's going to be a, a common thing that you're going to find in your atypical pneumonias. So when you get to clinical rotations, you see an x-ray and it looks just absolutely horrible. And they look okay. Don't be too alarmed at this point. Um, but try to figure out exactly what it is. So diagnosis. Um, <clears throat> We try to scrape this out. We do uh, gram stain. Uh, it's better for acid fast stain. It's positive on that guy. Uh, this is serum cold agglutination. Uh, this is one of our major things. That's why I have it as one of the only light blue things on this slide. You see serum cold agglutination, cough or dry cough. 
um, you know, just put these two and two together, you have mycoplasma pneumoniae. Uh, it's greater than four times increase or decrease in titers, so this is kind of different, depends on what stage they're in. Um, so our titers are pretty much IgM uh, related, and so we have to look uh, for that guy. Um, and our uh, memory immunity is so short that that's why, you know, if it's three weeks after they have an infection, it's a four times increase in titers. But then, you know, uh, three, four months after, and we try to look at it, it's going to be four times decrease in titers. Um, so kind of just uh, look, look for that, that, that change. So Legionella uh, pneumophilia. Um, so this is something that causes Legionnaire's disease or Pontiac fever. Um, Pontiac fever incorporates a lot of things. It's like all the, the different, the neuro, the GI symptoms, all that stuff. Um, and Legionnaires incorporates like the, the urine and stuff. Um, so it's a weak gram negative. Uh, they might not say it grams, gram stains at all. Um, it's motile, it's intracellular. Um, and you pretty much get this inhalation of the aerosol or aerosols like water. Um, you, there's no human to human transmission, but it's just from water sources. So sprinklers or drinking water or misters at like a, a fair or something, or even air conditioners. Air conditioner is the one that they like to, to give. And um, uh, that's how you, you get that. And it pretty much infects us as humans. Uh, so virulence factors, it's a facultative intracellular organism. Well, if it's living in water, meaning that's not a human, that's a water source, that means it's a facultative intracellular organism, meaning that it can live outside of cells and it can live inside cells. Um, and the cells that it likes to live in is alveolar macrophages. Um, but remember, environment. Don't forget that they can live in both places. Uh, it prevents fusion of phagolysosome. This is similar to tuberculosis. Um, symptoms are like pneumonia, you can have GI symptoms, uh, you know, diarrhea, nausea, uh, vomiting, uh, bloody sputum, uh, that's something that comes up with this, uh, that's your cough with blood in it, uh, so don't dif uh, differentiate this from Klebsiella is severe chunked uh, bloody sputum with a very high fever, rapid onset, they're feeling horrible, that's going to be, I'm now thinking, that's a typical pneumonia, bloody sputum, Klebsiella. Where here it's, okay, I have a cough and I have GI symptoms and bloody sputum. It's with like small amounts of bloody sputum. I'm thinking more of Legionella instead. Uh, also, you have bloody urine. Um, and this is a key feature of Legionella is you have bloody urine. Um, but that's another differential for adenovirus. So look at the symptoms. If it's pneumonia and um, it has bloody urine and a whole bunch of other things, neuro and GI, then you're thinking Legionella over adenovirus, okay? Uh, diagnosis, urinary antigen for serotype 1. This is uh, key, key, key. Definitely know this. This is how we kind of diagnose Legionella. And they'll just put in, they'll give you all these symptoms. You, come, you have to come to the diagnosis that it's Legionella, and the question will ask you, how do we diagnose specifically, um, or what do we look for? Urinary antigen. Pretty simple. Uh, we can also grow it on your BCYE agar, and they like testing that as well. And that's your uh, bovine charcoal yeast extract. Um, or, sorry, uh, is, is it bile? I think, it's, I think it's bile or something like that. So, whatever, that, that agar, BCYE. Uh, it's the only one that spells out those letters. All right, so tuberculosis. So this is mycobacterium tuberculosis. Uh, this is intracellular uh, organism that lives in alveolar macrophages. And uh, this is especially prevalent as the leading cause of death in HIV patients um, and AIDS patients. So a virulence for this, it prevents uh, oxidative birth, so it prevents it from being killed. It inhibits fusion of phagolysosome, which prevents it from being killed. It has an endotoxin known as lipoarabinomannan, which is different than LPS because this is mycobacterium. This is not a gram-negative uh, organism. It also has mycolic acid. So if they were to ask you, where does the stain of our um, zeal Nielsen stain or rhodamine aramine rods or our acid fasting, where does it go particular within the organism cell wall? That's mycolic acids. It finds mycolic acids, binds to it, and now we can say, hey, they're red or pink. Uh, long rat, uh, rods. Um, so uh, these guys secrete siderophores and they also produce niacin. So there's other mycobacterium species, you learn all those in skin, um, but this one in particular is the only one that produces niacin, so we know it's tuberculosis specifically. So how do we isolate it? So I posted this YouTube video um, and I'm going to post this file on my YouTube page 
Uh, you can also pretty much search it on YouTube. It's um, key and peel. That's that's or I think it's that's low. No, it's um, it's oh snap. Yeah. So key and peel uh, skit. Oh snap. It's only about three or four minutes. Um, you should maybe pause this video, go to YouTube, watch that video for three minutes, and then come back to this, and then my explanation will make a lot of sense, and you'll never forget it. Um, so I'll give you a, a, a couple seconds to, to pause this and, and go and do that. All right. So uh, after you hopefully watched that video, uh, pretty much went on. What went on was uh, we had our little doctor. He was explaining to one of his patients' uh, uh, son and he was uh, he was saying oh your mother is uh, is being ill she's getting old and uh, something about her weight and every time he said something him and his friends were sitting there and he's like oh snap like he's taking it as an insult and so uh, with this story um, I just put it in the, the case of the doctor telling him that oh your mother has tuberculosis and instead of oh snap it's oh that's low in Stein Jensen and so that's how I remember that Lowenstein Jensen auger is used for tuberculosis. Um, so we can also do acid fast uh, and Zill Nielsen. Uh, remember, this is super, super long growing. It takes like four or five weeks to grow. And so growing on Lowenstein Jensen is just for confirmation. We need to look at microscopy to diagnose this. Um, you can also do tuberculin tests, so 48 to 72 hours. Um, we kind of look at, uh, we put this tuberculin under your skin. Um, and we check for it to be kind of swelling. And uh, remember, they really love messing with people on this question. Uh, I actually caught it on the exam, but a, a lot of people didn't, and I feel really bad. Um, they used centimeters instead of millimeters. They give you, to practice all the, the measuring for this person's PPD test um, in millimeters, but then on the test they said two centimeters, and people were like, oh, it's two, that's less than five. Uh, millimeter or like five in that measurement but remember those are millimeters and centimeters don't mess that up two centimeters look at your arm and measure what two centimeters that's huge it's a giant swollen thing of course this is a positive test so don't mess that one up uh, gold standard for diagnosis however is quantiferon um, and so definitely do this um, uh, to, to diagnose it so vaccine, we have our BCG vaccine. Uh, it's given in some places like India and stuff. We give it in, in infancy in their arm, um, but uh, they, when they're old or whatever and we do a PPD, they're not gonna be positive and they're not gonna give us that false positive. The only reason it would give us a false positive is if they had that BCG vaccine as an adult and created immunity. Therefore, it would be positive on a PPD. You'll learn all about that in PATH uh, more, but just know how to diagnose it. Is it positive or negative? So now on to your fungal respiratory infections, and uh, we'll have lastly our aberrant ones. Um, these are kind of important to know that they are dimorphic, uh, non-opportunistic primary infections. Uh, that's our dimorphic ones, and then our monomorphic are our opportunistic ones. So histoplasmosis um, is our first one. So histoplasma plasma capsulatum. So this is a small based budding yeast. Uh, it has fungal spores that you find in macrophages. So here's a macrophage right up here. Um, and you can see his nucleus. So we know it's a macrophage and he's eating all these little fungi and we see these little guys. And if we were to zoom in on these, they would have small base budding. Um, and that would help us diagnose that this is histoplasma. The x-ray will show cannonball appearance. Um, I didn't show you a picture. You can Google that if you want. So how we get this is we get it from caves. Um, let me uh, put up my pen. So uh, we can get it from like cave spelunking. Why? Because it's bird and bat droppings within those caves or anything that increases nitrogen content. We can find histoplasma growing within that and we can breathe it in. Uh, we can also get it on bridges because guess what? Birds poop on bridges. Uh, also construction sites, guess what? Because there are birds that poop on construction sites and decaying buildings because we can have birds and bats in these decaying buildings. So watch out for that. That can cause histoplasma. Symptoms, so it mimics the tuberculosis. It's a long, slow progression, fevers, chills, night sweats, um, loss of weight even a little bit. Um, the capsulatum specific one is uh, can cause pulmonary and disseminated infections, especially in uh, HIV patients. And we're gonna get that in the United States, and this is gonna be in your Mississippi. Uh, that should be Mississippi, sorry for the misspelling. Mississippi and Ohio River Valleys. Um, 
which is pretty much central US, and then uh, Latin America, and then Du Bois is skin and bone lesions, and that's going to be in Africa. They're probably not going to ask you that one, but uh, the capsulatum definitely know that you get it in Mississippi and Ohio River Rally. So blastomycosis is another guy. Uh, this is our blastomyces dermatitidis, and this is broad base budding as opposed to the um, small base budding of histoplasma. So this is broad base budding, and so uh, we can have this guy up here. You can see um, him budding off, and this is very broad. So this is the space here. Uh, it's very broad distance uh, that we have him budding. Um, this is found in your Great Lakes and Ohio River Valley as well. So geography is going to help you kind of narrow it down. Uh, if you see geography always oh, from Ohio, uh, then that's pretty much going to tell you that we're either looking um, for a small base budding yeast found in macrophages or we're looking for one floating out by itself that is broad base budding. And that will tell me which one of these uh, is causing this. Um, so soil and dead decaying organic material is going to give you this infection. Uh, you're going to have pulmonary and disseminated infection, uh, but you also like to see or be looking for skin manifestations in this guy. Coccidiomycosis, so this is coccidioides, um, uh, imitis, and some other ones. Uh, imitis is the most uh, commonly tested one, so it's coccidioides and imitis. And coccidioides crowds spores in spherules. Uh, I definitely know those words. Um, that uh, it is spherules, this is high yield, and this is a spherule right up here and uh, right up here. So this is not a macrophage. Do I see a nucleus? Do I see a nucleus? No. Where back here in histoplasma, I saw a nucleus. Here's a nucleus and then there's little spores and this little globule. Um, here we have a globule, but I just see spore, uh, spores. I do not see a nucleus, so therefore this is known as a spherule. And spherules are found pretty much only in coccidiomycosis. And where do we find this is your southwest United States, so California, New Mexico, Arizona. Um, these are also overlap states for Yersinia pestis, which is the black plague. So don't get that uh, messed up. Uh, the symptoms are obviously far different. Um, this one has buboes and swollen things and lymph nodes and grossness. It's all black and disgusting. Uh, and that's the plague. And then uh, this guy pretty much causes lung infection, uh, especially in HIV patients. So you get in summer when the weather is nice and dry and dusty and someone went to the weather in Arizona or, so, or went to the, the desert in Arizona for no apparent reason in the middle of summer while it's 125. Um, but uh, that's uh, where you're going to get this guy from. Um, and uh, the spherules pretty much protect from phagocytosis. Um, and yeah, it's one of the most uh, virulent of all mycotic uh, pathogens that we have. One of them, it is not. Um, uh, well, actually, this one says it is the most virulent, but we also have uh, cryptococcus over here, which is very virulent. So they're kind of comparable. Um, so disease is known as valley fever. Um, because it's in the valley of the deserts in Arizona and California. Um, respiratory and extrapulmonary, um, and definitely you're going to be seeing that mainly in HIV and, and uh, immunocompromised patients. So cryptococcus uh, neoformans is the one that we're going to be talking about next. So uh, what causes this is uh, this organism, and what we can see over here, you can see a bunch of them. Uh, this is going to be seen in HIV patients or in people that inhale bird pigeon droppings for no apparent reason. Um, but just think of someone that has, oh, there's a bunch of pigeons roosting on our air conditioning system on top of our business building. Um, and air conditioning, yeah, I uh, spelled that wrong. Um, so uh, just pigeons pooping on air conditionings, that pretty much says, oh, I'm probably going to get coccidioides or uh, cryptococcus, sorry, cryptococcus. So uh, we in first inhale unencapsulated yeast, and this is super particular. Know that it is unencapsulated. And once we uh, uh, inhale this guy, it meets our little cells and it says, hello, let me make my capsule. So, and so what that makes is glucuronolaxolamanin capsule, uh, GXM capsule. It's the only fungus with a capsule, only one. So if you see a fungus with a capsule, you have legitimately cryptococcus neoformans, and it's this guy right here. You have nothing else. It's only one. Um, and it's strong affinity. It likes the CNS. So this is one of our leading causes of meningitis, fungal meningitis, cryptococcus neoformans. Other stuff, yeah, maybe. But this is the one you're associating with this. A diagnosis, uh, pretty much we can do capsular anti-staining, which we see here, which is uh, India Inc., and uh, it doesn't stain the capsule, it doesn't stain the organ, it stains everything around it, so that's why it's like this color here. And we can see that capsule is nice and, and thick. 
Other things we can stain the capsule straight up, and that's your mucicarmine stain. All right, Pneumocystis girovecci, we're uh, heading down to our last few organisms. So Pneumocystis girovecci, so uh, this is actually the most common opportunistic infection seen in HIV patients. Uh, and this is considered when it's AIDS or CD4 count less than 200. Um, this is a disc shaped um, or cup shaped uh, uh, cyst that you're gonna find. So if you go actually look here, you can see one here uh, and here. It actually looks like if I were to make a cup out of this, right? So you have this kind of indent, and here's another cup here. Uh, if you look at it from the side, they're disc shaped, right? If I look at them straight on, but if I look from the side, they're making this uh, kind of cup shape, like a, like a wine glass sort of. And that's your uh, cup shape or di disc shaped. Uh, you can also see trophozoites. I don't know how, because this is a fungus. Um, so, uh, for some reason, we had some sputum coughed up from people that had this infection when H H HIV came into play, and uh, uh, our microbiologists were like, hey, it looks like cysts. They must be um, some sort of parasites or protozoans. So, look, there's cysts, and then maybe over here is some trophozoites. Um, but you'll see this, they still describe them as this, even though they're pretty much um, fungus. Uh, so that's why we still call them cysts, and that's why it's called pneumocystis girovecci. Um, HIV pneumonia is the thing uh, we're associating with this, a dry cough, and on uh, histo we're going to see a cotton candy appearance on, his, uh, on that. Uh, this guy lacks ergosterol. This is super high yield uh, in the cell wall. This is what differentiates it from all your other fungal infections uh, and all your other... Um, yeah, all your other fungal infections. Those other guys have ergosterol in their cell wall. This guy does not. All right, aspergillosis. So aspergillus, um, um, there's a, a few of them, but asper just know aspergillus. Um, this is acute angle branching. So A in aspergillosis um, is for acute angle branching, and it has septa. So you can see the little septa guys right here, right, in this little picture. Um, and then we see that this is an acute angle that it's branching out. And so that's going to be your acute angle branching septae. That's aspergillosis. It's an opportunistic infection in immunocompromised patients. Uh, there's an allergic type, uh, so you're going to have allergic reaction. We have an invasive type. That's usually when there's already a cavity from TB or some sort of abscess that we cleared. Um, that's an invasive type. And once we invaded that, we can create a ball. This is known as a fungal ball um, in that cavity, and this can lead to homoptysis. But remember, differential diagnosis is TB. But if you see this ball and it's rolling around when the patient moves around, then we know it's a fungal ball, not TB, because that's adhered to the wall. Uh, and a fungal wall uh, ball it can roll around, so like a maraca, a lung maraca. But key feature here, neutropenia. If you remember that you have a, some like cavitation in the lung with hemoptysis and neutropenia, you have aspergillosis. That neutropenia is so key. That will get you so many questions on microbiology exams, uh, not to mention your pathophysiology of infections exams. This is a, a key feature that helps you pick this guy over any other ones. Um, you also have uh, the hemoptysis and invasive pneumonia is just the basic symptoms. All right, last guys. So ornithosis, also caused from chlamydophila cetaci. Uh, it is an intracellular thing, as we know cl chlamydias or chlamydophilas are intracellular organisms. Uh, it is gram negative if we somehow are able to get it out of the cell and gram stain it. Um, usually uh, they won't give you a gram stain. Um, we can see uh, it coming out of excretions and urine, respiratory droplets of birds. Um, so even if a bird just flies over you and coughs, you can get this guy from them, which is kind of scary. Uh, things you're going to get this is obviously exposures to birds, so veterinarians, zookeepers, pet shop workers, and the one they really like is a chicken farmer. So a guy, oh, he just got in 200 new chickens at his chicken farm, and he's got a cough. <clears throat> I, don't, I don't think you need to go any further than that. He's got Chlamydophilia cetaci most likely. Unless they say pigeon droppings, and then they say, oh, there's macrophages, um, with uh, all these little fungal things within them, then yeah, that's histoplasma. Or else it's pretty uh, giveaway that we're talking about this guy. There's inclusion bodies, and so there's different aspects. There's the metabolically inactive, and this is your infectious elementary bodies, and your meta me metabolically active once you're inside the cell, non-infectious reticulate bodies. So definitely they like asking those guys. Um, and they have these outer proteins, your MOMP, 
and your OMP. Uh, that's important, but it also has LPS because it's gram negative. Uh, this causes atypical pneumonia, uh, headaches, fevers, chills, myalgia, non-productive cough, and uh, nerve, neurological liver problems. And also because it's chlamydia, we know chlamydia can cause not only urogenital problems, but this one is more specific to the eye, and so it can cause conjunctivitis. All right, hantavirus. So this is a pulmonary syndrome, um, and this is uh, really bad, actually. Hantavirus is one of your bunya vir uh, viruses, which is in your single-stranded RNA, uh, group 5 uh, negative uh, single-strand RNA viruses. It has an envelope. Uh, this is caused from your Hantan virus, hemorrhagic fever and renal syndrome, or Sinobre virus. Uh, this is the most common one, actually. Uh, you get it from rats or your deer mice. Deer mice is more specific. Um, and pretty much you're looking at some old people that live at a, uh, a farm, and it's becoming wintertime. It's getting colder. They're burning coals at their fire to stay warm. Um, and so are the mice and rats. They're like, hey, um, it's warm in these people's house that are burning fire and they're hanging out by the fireplace. It's going to hang with them. So barns and sheds and uh, uh, farmhouses and stuff like that, uh, that's when these mice are going to go indoors and uh, they're pretty much going to urinate and poop and spit and bite you. Um, and so that's uh, where you're going to get this guy from and that's your uh, hantavirus. Uh, and from these dead deer mice, they're going to haunt you forever. Um, and so that's your haunted virus, right? Because old spooky places like, you know, I'm just thinking of an old haunted mansion, uh, which is an old haunted barn uh, with deer mice in it. So those mice are going to haunt you for haunted virus. So pretty much what happens is you have uh, an increase in capillary per permeability in the first stage. Um, this is uh, well, second stage. Prodromal is just the general symptoms, but the, the next stage, so they're going to present someone, oh, he had myalgias and vomiting and headache, and then a couple days, a few days later, suddenly they just like, oh, they feel like septic, they have low blood pressure, they have a dry cough and pulmonary edema. edema. This is known as your cardiopulmonary stage. This is so important. This this virus know every stage. Know all the, every detail you have from all these slides, know everything from this. And then magically, all the fluid you seeped out into your extra, uh, extracellular space and interstitial space, you suck it all back in and put it back in the blood, and that pushes it through your kidneys, so suddenly you start peeing a lot. Um, and so this is your convalescent diuretic stage. Uh, diagnosis, because it's a virus, again, a and PCR. Prevention, uh, seal up holes and put in mouse traps. Uh, Maliodosis and white mores, and I believe this is the last slide. Um, and this is, uh, this is actually kind of interesting. I like this guy. So this is caused from Burkholderia pseudomalia. And uh, I have some of these letters emphasized, and I'll explain that in a minute. So this is a gram-negative rod. It's bipolar staining, and I put a picture of what that means. Uh, pretty much what that means is uh, we have um, – uh, pretty much we stain at one end of this organism, and we stain at the other end, but the other one, the middle portion, doesn't really stain. Uh, so it's usually just darker on, on each of the ends of the of the rod. Other things you might see that in are, are your cinea pestis. Um, your black plague has this kind of staining, but they're really big, giant rods, so you can tell the difference between these guys. Um, you get this from, like, in soil and fresh water. The water is the key feature here. So uh, this is a, a risk factor for cystic fibrosis. So we've come across a few of these. So cystic fibrosis, you're thinking uh, of your pseudomonas, and this is another one. Your meliodosis, white mores, or Burkholderia pseudomelia is the actual organism that is associated with cystic fibrosis. Um, alcoholics, gardeners in endemic areas. And what are those endemic areas? This is Asia, India, and Australia. So transmission, pretty much if you get a cut, while you're in this water, you're going to have a boule formation and uh, infection of the skin wherever you got that cut. Uh, if you inhale it or aspirate it or ingest the infected water, it can cause pneumonia. Um, how we diagnose this is we grow it on Ashdown's auger and it shows this cornflower head morphology. So the way I remember this is this little mnemonic I made up. So when you're holding, so Burke Holdaria, a piece of male, pseudomalia, uh, from your pen pal in Asia, which is just one of the epidemiological places. So when they send you uh, this mail uh, and they're from Asia, then you cut yourself on that letter. Darn it. And that's pericutaneous in, um, inoculation. And you read it. And when you're done, you burn it down to ash. So ash downs augers, which you grow Burkholderia pseudomelia. 
And then uh, obviously from the smoke, when you're burning it down to ash, you cough a little bit. So don't remember, don't forget that this causes pneumonia. So hopefully this kind of sums up uh, your organisms, gives you helpful ways to remember them. Uh, Jeff, definitely practice uh, of some questions. Um, if you have any sources for that, uh, sources such as like pretest are actually pretty good. Um, but you have to kind of sift through what organisms you've done because you might get to questions you can't answer yet. Um, so it might take a little while, but maybe spend a little bit of time going through uh, respiratory practice from that and it might be able to help. Um, UWorld actually could help too because it actually separates it by respiratory, so you might be able to do those. Um, and uh, if you don't have new UWorld, I have old UWorld. Uh, they, they posted those files on a lot of uh, your guys' Facebook pages so you can get those. Um, but definitely be able to just recognize the basics, like what's, what's the presentation for upper respiratory, what's the presentation for uh, upper that progresses to lower respiratory, and then what um, presentation for lower respiratory infection, right? And then there's all those particular ones that I, that I gave examples for. Um, so hopefully this helps, and uh, happy studying. Good luck on your exams, everybody. Med School Tutor! You're at SGU, and you're thinking about step one. There are so many resources and so many opinions. How do you know which path to take? You've worked so hard and you deserve to match into the specialty of your dreams. Med School Tutors has helped nearly a thousand SGU students get their best scores on their CBSE and USMLEs through highly personalized one-on-one -on -one tutoring and individualized advice. Our SGU students see average Step 1 score increases of over 30 points when working with us. Scores that are their tickets to competitive residency spots around the country. Schedule your free phone consult today to be matched with your tutor. Med School Tutors. Get where you want to go.